Hello friends! Not that long ago a horrifying catastrophe happened. It was the earthquake in Turkey and Syria, which claimed the lives of at least 50,000 people. Many still wonder, in our age of advanced technology and science, why can't we still predict earthquakes? When did humanity actually learn to predict them, if did at all, and have such disasters occurred in our history before? Well, they have of course. One of the most dreadful such disasters was the Great Lisbon Earthquake. And it was a catastrophe not only because it claimed between 50,000 to 100,000 lives in Lisbon, according to different estimates, but also because it obliterated a superpower of its time. After the monstrous earthquake of 1755, the Portuguese Empire was decapitated. The Tower of Belem is one of the principal architectural landmarks of Lisbon and it's one of the few buildings that survived the earthquake unscathed. The tower was originally built in the sea, but due to the earthquake the water receded and now it's located on the beach. That's at least the most widely accepted version. However, locals claim otherwise. They say the tower was actually destroyed, but they built it again using the same stones. But let's get back to the earthquake and talk about how this all unfolded. So on November 1st, 1755, it was All Saints Day, a crucial Catholic holiday. Lisbon was a profoundly devout city with a vast number of monasteries, churches and chapels. One of the most influential institutions here was the Jesuit order, and lavish offerings were made to the church both by monarchs and merchants. What kind of country was Portugal around 9 am on that day? Well, it was a colossal empire. The first division of the world didn't happen in Europe, it happened in South America between Portugal and Spain, when these two major maritime powers, with the mediation of the Pope, divided the New World. Lisbon in the middle of the 18th century was one of the most important ports, ranking third in volume after London and Amsterdam. It served as a massive hub where goods like spices, tobacco, gold, silver, sugar, coffee, etc. were brought in. Portugal at the time held such territories as Paraguay, Brazil, Goa, Macau and the Azores, making it a very affluent state. The Royal Museum housed stunning collections featuring works by Rubens and Titian. So, to sum up, Lisbon at the time was home to fabulously prosperous people. So, on November 1st, the city awakened and all its residents went to pray. Thousands of people filled the churches and monasteries. I mentioned earlier that it was an extremely devout city, and it's this devoutness that later gave birth to the philosophical postulate that God doesn't exist. Because the Lisbon citizens prayed so fervently, and yet such a catastrophe befell them. Travelers describe walking through the city when suddenly a procession of wealthy townsfolk barefoot and in tatters spontaneously begins. They were engaging in some form of self-purification and were collectively confessing their sins. So around 9.20 in the morning, people felt the first tremor. Candles started swaying and at some point, ceilings began to crack, plaster and bricks started falling down. People didn't understand what was happening yet. Following the first tremor, a second one struck and then a third one. This is how the monstrous destruction of the city began. Between the second and third tremor, it became clear that something unbelievable was happening. The end of the world. Buildings began to collapse and settle like house of cards. One of the most vivid memories of those who witnessed it was that when looking at the city of Lisbon from the port side, you could see the buildings falling like wheat stalks in a field. Just like dominoes. The city started crumbling, and in the pause between the second and third tremors, people rushed out of the churches realizing they needed to find safety. They ran towards the water to board ships and escape. But when they reached the harbor, they noticed that the water had receded, leaving the entire bottom of the harbor exposed. And they had no idea what it meant. So people tried to board the ships, and at that moment a massive wave arrived. A tsunami 12 to 25 meters in height according to different sources, swept all these unfortunate people away into the ocean. Then the third tremor occurred, and all this happened within up to 20 minutes. The city simply ceased to exist. 
The survivors tried to flee, everything was buried under rubble and filled with moans and stench. But the most horrifying thing was the darkness. Imagine the extent of the devastation, it even blocked out the sun. Dust from the collapsed buildings rose and obscured the sky. It was indeed the end of the world. Later it would be discovered that the epicenter of the seismic activity was approximately 320 kilometers out in the ocean. Sailors who were at sea that moment described a wave passing beneath their ships that caused people on deck to fall even though the sea was calm. This immense force is what struck Lisbon, destroying it within several minutes. After the tsunami receded, monstrous fires broke out in Lisbon because everyone in the churches had candles. And of course, they all dropped them as they fled in search of safety, igniting the city. The city was in ruins, massive cracks in the ground, a huge tsunami, and then fire. At this point, it's essential to mention that there were obviously no emergency response structures in Western Europe at the time. The world had never experienced anything like that before, and Portugal was entirely unprepared. So, no one could possibly have a clear rescue plan. Some in the city tried to dig out their loved ones from the rubble, but it was nearly impossible. The king, José I, was in his residence in the suburbs of Lisbon. The Secretary of State, which is basically the Prime Minister, the Marquis of Pombo, came and informed him that the city no longer existed. The king was in complete confusion, not knowing what to do. What do we have to do, he asked. The Marquis responded with a phrase that became legendary. We must feed the living and bury the dead. And it was not just a figure of speech, because Lisbon burned down together with the granaries for the entire province. The fires would continue for five days, and desperate people were fleeing the city. At that moment, marauders entered, seizing other people's possessions, while these deranged priests would not allow anyone to be buried. This is punishment for our sins, they said, and we won't permit anyone to be interred without absolution. The Marquis argued, there are 30,000 corpses in the city at the moment, and an epidemic will soon break out. Eventually, he resorted to force. The army was deployed in the city, engaging in a fierce battle against the marauders. They erected gallows at all entrances to Lisbon and started hanging them. The Marquis brought food to the capital from other provinces, while bodies were loaded onto barges and there, in the open sea, people found their final resting place, completely disregarding the clergy. However, the Lisbon catastrophe didn't end there. As I mentioned before, the king had no clue what to do, and this impression left such a profound mark on him that he would spend the rest of his life sleeping in tents, fearing another earthquake. To illustrate the scale of the disaster, 85% of the city's buildings were destroyed. This included 53 palaces, 31 monasteries, 75 chapels, and 32 churches. A luxurious archive, royal paintings, including works by Rubens and Titian, all perished in the flames. The cultural damage was utterly incredible. Just a week before this disaster, another fleet arrived from Brazil carrying several million reals worth of gold. This fleet unloaded the gold, which also met its demise in the fire. So the economic, cultural and human losses were absolutely staggering. The Marquis began the city's restructuring from clearing away the rubble. A general mobilization was announced and the army worked tirelessly to clear the debris. Initially, the plan was to rebuild the city in its former state, but the Marquis contested the king's decision and eventually succeeded in having the city built anew. I'll say a few words about the Marquis of Pombal, one of the most significant figures in Portuguese history. The Marquis of Pombal was an outstanding statesman hailing from an influential family. His initial position as the Portuguese ambassador in London was of paramount importance, akin to serving as an ambassador to the United States for any European diplomat today. Besides, Portugal had deep-rooted ties with Britain, making the role of ambassador in London one of the most crucial posts. Upon returning from London, he assumed the position of Secretary of War and Foreign Affairs, which placed him in control of both domestic and foreign policies. 
The country was engaged in conflicts with Spain and Portuguese forces were actively involved in their colonies, so the Marquis held one of the highest offices in the government. In addition to overseeing the reconstruction of Lisbon, he implemented pivotal reforms in education and finance. He also played a significant role in shaping the Portuguese wine industry, particularly port wine. The Marquis of Pombal developed the first wine legislation inspired by the French model, which dictated that grapes had to be harvested within specified regions and wine had to be made from particular grape varieties. These regulations significantly improved the quality and value of Portuguese wines, with England being their primary purchaser. During the latter part of his life, the Marquis waged a battle against the Jesuit order, which, as you already know, held substantial influence in Portugal. The Jesuits sought to control internal politics, culture, and, in general, the lives of the people. Their primary weapon against the Marquis reforms was to accuse him of various sins, of course. But the Marquis countered their resistance and eventually succeeded in challenging the Jesuit order's dominance in Portugal. The Jesuits protested vigorously against his actions because, indeed, the Marquis held enormous influence over the king and controlled everything happening in the country. However, instead of retreating to his residence and doing nothing just like most other people would have done, he took on the monumental task of leading the reconstruction of Lisbon and of the whole country. Under his leadership, Lisbon was completely redesigned by military architects. After the city's architectural plan was approved, the Marquis of Pombal oversaw its construction over a span of 15 years. All buildings were rigorously assessed for seismic stability. This involved a squad of soldiers marching on the rooftops of newly constructed buildings. If the walls did not shake, the building was deemed sound. Otherwise, it was demolished. The Marquis prohibited the haphazard and incoordinated construction so typical of Southern Europe, where shanty structures were built one on top of another. Under his leadership, any legal construction came to an end. As I mentioned before, he distributed bread to the hungry and fought against marauders. Moreover, the Marquis started developing the principles for the functioning of the new city. When you visit Lisbon, remember that all the city's logistics were devised by the Marquis of Pombal. For its time, it was an exceptional architectural achievement and a brilliant urban planning solution by today's standards. The Marquis of Pombal saved the city. However, most importantly, alongside the reconstruction of Lisbon, the Marquis spent many years attempting to understand the nature of earthquakes. He wanted to know how to predict them, and he dispatched officials throughout Portugal to gather and record data about any peculiarities that occurred before the Great Lisbon Earthquake. What happened in the week before? Two weeks? A month? In the rest of Europe, people also were doing the same because the earthquake which devastated Lisbon was not confined to Lisbon alone. Tremors were even reported in Central Europe. Church bells in Germany started swinging on their own. In essence, the earthquake was of truly terrifying magnitude. It's hard to tell the exact magnitude now, but these were truly strikes of some entirely phenomenal force, since they spread across Europe like ripples in the water. I find various data regarding the earthquake's magnitude, ranging from 8.5 to 9 on the Richter scale. For comparison, the recent earthquake in Turkey measured 7.8, and you could see the impact. So the Marquis began to delve into seismology, and the team working under his leadership understood that not everything had happened suddenly. In the weeks and months leading up to the earthquake, people across the country had recorded strange phenomena. Some wells went dry, while others overflowed. Odd tides occurred in Galicia, Spain, and in northern Portugal. Snakes emerged from their barrows and began to ascend the mountains in massive numbers. Within two days, birds migrated and the water changed in taste, developing a strange metallic flavor. In other words, this earthquake had its omens. People, of course, didn't know how to work with them, and as it turns out, even today they don't really have a clear understanding, and no one could predict what would happen. When data started arriving from Europe, they learned that even in Ireland there were noticeable consequences. In one of the ports, there was a whirlpool that nearly sucked two ships into its depths. 
In essence, all Europe was trembling. But not all the buildings in Lisbon were destroyed, of course. This is one of the oldest houses in Lisbon, dating back to the 16th century. It survived because many buildings around it collapsed, protecting its walls from falling apart. Several houses in the city were preserved, including, believe it or not, the red light district on Rua Formosa, a district of sin, debauchery and revelry. It remained practically intact, which is a remarkable twist of fate. Then there was a terrible legend that one of the houses in the district belonged to the Marquis of Pombo, implying that he was also a great sinner and, of course, the man associated with all these terrible things that befell the city. There was one insane monk, Gabriel Malagrida, a Jesuit who wandered among the ruins and preached that the city, steeped in sin, deserved this heavenly punishment in the form of an earthquake. In the end, the Marquis burned him at the stake as a heretic and from that point, the destruction of the Jesuit order began. They were subsequently accused of attempting to overthrow the state and plotting against the king's life. So, eventually, the order was expelled from Portugal. The earthquake had phenomenal consequences in all areas of life. The church bells, ringing on their own without any ringers, filled people's hearts with a mystic horror. The news about the earthquake spread rapidly across Europe. By then, newspapers existed, and they were the chief source of entertainment, read by all the elites. Naturally, this information later trickled down to the other social layers, so everyone was talking about it. The news about Lisbon reached even St. Petersburg in Russia, and the people there, just like everywhere else, were deeply impressed by the earthquake, because humanity by that time had experienced wars and mass epidemics, but what Europe had not experienced were acts of God, such as this one. I mean, there was knowledge of a terrible earthquake that had destroyed Herculaneum and Pompeii during the Roman Empire, but it was so long ago, it sounded almost like a myth. So, on one hand, as I said, there was this mystical fear, anticipation of divine retribution. This belief was deeply rooted at the time, mainly due to the strength of the Catholic Church and the strong belief in God. If people were seen as sinners in the eyes of God, then certainly this earthquake is his punishment. On the other hand, though, society has changed. For example, Voltaire wrote poem on the Lisbon disaster, asking the following. God is avenged, the wage of sin is death. What crime, what sin had those young hearts conceived that lie bleeding and torn on mother's breast? Did fall in Lisbon deeper drink of vice than London, Paris, or sunlit Madrid? So Voltaire generally proclaimed, if you translate it from the language of poetry, that Lisbon was probably the most devout city in the world, and do you really believe that they were all sinners there? Or that Lisbon was worse than London or Paris? Of course not. This wave of thought spread among the enlightened thinkers of the time, questioning why such punishment came upon innocent people. Subsequently, this evolved into another conflict, the Enlightenment philosophers versus the Catholic world. Of course, the Church was not pleased with this because the dogma of the faith was being questioned. Nevertheless, philosophy evolves and transitions from Romanticism to Pragmatism. Undoubtedly, these Enlightenment philosophers will later be criticized and even blamed for breaking down society to such an extent with their atheism and the absence of preference for the throne and hierarchy that they played a significant role in the lead-up to the French Revolution. And to some extent, this is true, but the degree of horror from the disaster that just had happened next door in Portugal is so high that it profoundly changes the world by itself. This idea that the forces of nature that are beyond human control are not driven by God was later called rationalism. The Marquis of Pombal acts in line with this new philosophy too. All his persecutions against the Jesuit order are also dictated by this new philosophy, which says, you guys are telling us that we were punished by God. Do you remember how many monasteries there were in Lisbon? What gifts were sent to the church, to the Jesuit order? Didn't you pray enough for us 
The Marquis will vehemently fight against the Order, and eventually the Jesuits will be defeated in Portugal. Although later, the daughter of José I, Maria I, will expel the Marquis of Pombal himself, bringing back the Jesuits, and reverse their forms. But nonetheless, the secularism of Europe, to a large extent, stems from this earthquake. It must be said that during the Lisbon earthquake, a vast number of elites perished. Officials, military personnel, administrators, and virtually all layers of the population suffered immense losses, regardless of their social status. Portugal, in addition to the financial and economic crisis, faced a terrible shortage of managerial personnel. In the aftermath, many would argue that there was practically no one left to govern the country. So, my friends, this is what the Lisbon earthquake was like. But why did I mention the end of the Portuguese Empire in the beginning of the video? Well, because Portugal practically vanished from the global political stage after this disaster. Just consider this. Cultural treasures worth 800 million gold francs were destroyed, the country was hit by famine, and of course, all these reforms and the reconstruction of Lisbon had to be financed somehow. This created a huge deficit in the treasury and removed Portugal from the list of global powers forever. In conclusion, I'd like to say a few more words about the Marquis of Pombal. In the twilight of his life, he was sent into exile by the new queen, Maria I, who saw that all power in the country was in his hands. So he was accused of conspiracy and stripped of all titles. Furthermore, they even wanted to sentence him to death for corruption. Such was his fate. Nonetheless, today, there are memorials, squares and streets named after him throughout whole Portugal. In any case, in the country's history, he is remembered alongside this great earthquake. By the way, I'm still starting on YouTube, so any kind of support, like, subscription, comment, is gonna help me a lot. Thank you for your attention and see you soon.